Okay. Good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, Wei Chow, the president of the Foreign Area Officer Association, Korea chapter. Today in our coffee and chat series, we are joined with a strategist, a business executive, a diplomat, defense policy expert, and a retired Army FAO. After retiring as the director of Army International Affairs, he founded the consulting company Clink Global LLC, and from there, he was appointed as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, serving up to this year. He is now advisor to the National Bureau of Asian Research, consultant to the Institute for Defense Analyses, and distinguished member and advisor to the Foreign Area Officer Association Korea Chapter. Um, now, before Colonel Klink's opening remarks, I would like to remind our audience today that this session will be made public so any discussion and questions should remain at the unclassified level. As this is part of our coffee and chat series, I'll open with a few scene setter questions, and then we will allow for a free flow discussion between today's attendees. Uh, Colonel Klink, if you can provide any opening remarks. Well, good evening from Washington and good morning to all of you on the peninsula. It's great to be with you. Uh, I will tell you, usually on a Friday night at this time, I'm in bed, so I'm really excited just to be awake and, and talking to some people. Uh, but in all seriousness, it's really my pleasure to uh, reconnect with so many friends and colleagues to discuss you know, one of the most important alliances that the United States has, as well as discuss the key role that uh, South Korea plays in a free and open Indo-Pacific and to kind of talk about you know both the opportunities for the alliance as well as some of the challenges and you know and i will freely admit that during my time in office uh, unfortunately the relationship was framed more by challenges than it was opportunities and i'm also very happy to acknowledge that my sense now as an outside observer is that some of those challenges have been overcome and that we're now in focus on what binds us together as two peoples that live in vibrant democracies and appreciate all that freedom and capitalism have to offer. So again, thanks very much for taking the time to, uh, to spend with me today. Okay, uh, well, thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, Afghanistan. Uh, like many veterans, I deployed to Afghanistan. I was a platoon leader. And watching recent events unfold has, has been a challenge, to be perfectly honest. In a, in a similar vein, uh, we've seen some rumblings from allies in Asia that have sort of been somewhat questioning the U.S. commitment. Um, so my question is, what, what would you recommend to those that are working with our allied partners every day to sort of assuage these notions? And for all of the negatives on the Afghanistan withdrawal, do you see a way of making this a positive in the long run with regards to our Indo-Asia Pacific allies and partners? Well, I'll, I will tell you that I too have struggled with the events of the last 30 days or so. Um, and that has only uh, been underscored by the news that came out this afternoon here in Washington uh, that, you know, unfortunately and tragically, we killed innocent civilians in Kabul uh, in the aftermath of the uh, ISIS-K attack at, um, at Kabul airport that killed 13 U.S. service members. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I have a very, very difficult time coming up with any silver linings associated with our withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, I will say to you up front that I was never an advocate for the complete and total withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan. Um, I, you know, I was in the Trump administration, and I know it was President Trump's intent to pull everybody out. Um, uh, if I had been asked, I would have respectfully offered 
my voice saying that I think we should keep Bagram and we should keep a footprint there, both because of the counter-terror fight uh, that will always be there, quite frankly, but, but as well as keeping a lily pad for our forces uh, and particular our intelligence assets uh, you know, in a country that borders China and a country that borders you know, several states of the former Soviet Union. The withdrawal itself, I think uh, how we did it, in essence, I think it was a self-inflicted crisis. It didn't have to be that way. And I think it, it does cast a shadow on the stellar record of the U.S. military, frankly. Um, and as somebody who retired after you know, almost 30 years of service and served in combat myself when I was a young officer, um, you know, it, 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 uh, I think that our forces were put in a position for political reasons that they did not need to be placed in. So uh, again, I believe that uh, there is really not much of a silver lining there. Um, all that being said, uh, the administration's narrative is that this will allow us to uh, focus more on great power competition, particularly with respect to China. Um, I will hold them to their word and their intent. Um, I certainly support a greater allocation of resources to the Indo-Pacific, uh, particularly as I witnessed myself that even though the Indo-Pacific was deemed the priority theater in the national defense strategy in 2018, um, you know, strategy is budget and budget is strategy. And if you looked at the budget, it did not, you know, particularly support that statement. I also believe SACOM consistently was able to be more of a magnet for resources because of whatever the crisis du jour may have been at the time, whether it was Iran or Afghanistan or Iraq, what have you. So hopefully that narrative now uh, will shift so that uh, Admiral Aguilino will be able to get the types of resources that Admiral Davidson did not get. Um, I think though that our allies and partners, particularly in, in those countries where we have a presence such as South Korea and Japan who work with our militaries day to day, understand that uh, this particular episode is not emblematic of uh, our military capabilities, obviously, and that we were, we were the military, in essence, was playing a, a hand that it was dealt by its political leadership. With respect to commitment, uh, political commitment, you know, again, Afghanistan and the Ghani government of Afghanistan uh, is not the same as the, our treaty partners in the region. So I don't want to draw parallels, you know, because number one, uh, I don't think they're relevant. Uh, and number two, uh, I, I don't want to get into the type of uh, discussion that the, the Chinese are now propagating, uh, you know, through their dis and misinformation campaigns. I see a lot of that media as well. I, uh, I would like to refocus on, on Korea for a moment. Um, so there have been several key events that have happened or on the horizon that can potentially have huge ramifications for the alliance. Uh, North Korea is ramp seems to be ramping up its cycle of provocation despite continued South Korean peace overtures. Uh, President Moon's approval rating is continuing to decline while the rock presidential election looms. And then, as you're probably one of the most well-versed um, people in the country, you know that the uh, military community uh, meeting and the security consultative meeting are, are also taking place soon. Uh, so should we be re-examining the role or objectives of the Rock US Alliance during, during this period of dynamism and in what ways? So I will tell you that when I was in office, um, the SCM, and let me focus my comments on the SCM, because that's obviously the forum in which I was involved, uh, since that's the forum uh, co-chaired between the U.S. Secretary of Defense and the Iraq Minister of Defense. Um, and, the, and that, when I was in office, focused very heavily, frankly, on 
issues that were more challenges than opportunities, like I alluded to in my opening remarks. We spent a lot of time talking about SMA, quite frankly. We spent a lot of time also talking about OpCon uh, transition, and we made very little progress on either. As a matter of fact, I think you could say we made no progress on either. Uh, and I think it ended up, um, we were, you know, we went in circles a lot and it was certainly frustrating uh, for, I think, the principals as well. And, you know, and then I would tell you the last SCM last, I think it was October uh, in Washington, you know, that frustration level peaked and you saw some of that uh, in, uh, in media report. Um, but it is a forum at which, again, the senior most leaders of our defense establishment should be able to exchange candidly views on key issues of the alliance, uh, as well as, and I think this is the important part, is actually to decide on a way ahead. Instead, what I found is that the venue, at least again, while I was in office, often was more focused on, um, you know, what was the joint communicate going to say? And we expended countless hours on negotiating the verbiage of the joint communiques. And frankly, uh, it got to the point where I said, and I would say much to the frustration uh, of my counterparts, I, I said that, listen, we are done with the joint communique now. We can either go with this version that we've been working on literally for weeks, or we don't have to put anything out at all. And uh, because the reality is in the United States, there is no particular audience for these joint communiques. Nobody, frankly, except for those career watchers uh, would even notice if what the document wasn't uh, published. But in South Korea, obviously, it was different. And that's why this was something that was certainly of much greater significance for the South Koreans than it was for the United States. So, uh, but back to the substance, uh, OpCon transition was uh, obviously, again, something that was a, a focal point for us, uh, as were other issues such as training readiness, access to the FAD site, and of course, talking about the DPRK and talking about um, varying approaches to the DPRK. And you mentioned the, the South Korean overtures that have been regularly, consistently, constantly uh, blown off by Pyongyang, almost, uh, frankly, embarrassingly so. Uh, and now we find ourselves, it appears, at least if the last, the, the events of the last week or so, indication that the DPRK is ready to perhaps again tease the outside world with uh, some new uh, a new provocation cycle perhaps although there are certain things that were I think interpreted by the DPRK and for good reason as red lines by the United States that they have not yet crossed so whereas you know there are many observers who would argue that in the previous several years the DPRK has been able to continue its military modernization. You know, there are other voices that would say, yes, uh, but there are certain things that at least we have not publicly seen yet, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to continue to keep a lid on this. So that again takes us to the upcoming MCM and SCM. And again, the MCM is usually the day before the SCM. So there's, there is some overlap, but uh, the MCM, you know, uh, again, being uh, the military, that you see new uniform leaders engaging. But at the SCM that's coming up, what I as an outside observer now will be interested to see is in fact, uh, how is the DPRK being characterized? Uh, is there anything that's going to be mentioned or what is going to be mentioned about OPCON transition? I think we all know that it was President Moon's objective for OPCON transition to occur before his term of office ends. I don't think that's going to happen, quite frankly. I don't think anybody thinks that's going to happen. But I will be interested to see, is there something that's going to come out of the SCM 
him uh, that could potentially serve as a legacy item for President Moody. And one of the reasons uh, I think that this is a particularly interesting point is because I believe that in the last you know, six, seven months of the Biden administration, my sense is that strategically, at least in the public domain, and again, I only have access to public information now, in the public domain, strategically, South Korea and the United States have become more aligned, particularly on China. So if you think back, for instance, in the, what was it, late winter, early spring, when Secretaries Austin and Blinken traveled first to Tokyo for two plus two, and if you read the joint statement that came out of that meeting, it was very robust and it called out the Chinese uh, pretty squarely. And uh, that was no surprise, frankly. I think everybody anticipated that. And then if you fast forward, I think it was two days later, maybe three days later, when a joint statement was issued uh, from the two plus two in Seoul, it was very vanilla. It was very, you know, didn't call out the Chinese. Again, nobody was surprised, I don't think, because I don't, you know, I don't think anybody really anticipated um, that uh, the Moon administration would publicly uh, call out China. But then when Moon, President Moon, visited the White House and met with President Biden, and when that joint statement was released and the words Taiwan Strait were actually in that document, I will tell you, I was absolutely amazed surprised and i've said it before if i would have bet money on that i would have lost because i did not anticipate that happening i personally view that as a positive development quite frankly you know but as an outsider now i would really be curious as to how did we get the south koreans to agree to that i have some ideas so, you know part of those ideas are perhaps uh, based on the fact that i think the south koreans probably there's a little bit of uh, i guess you could say competition perhaps but you know uh, when it comes to u.s japanese relations and US south korean relations and that the south koreans perhaps thought that uh particularly since prime minister suga was the very first foreign visitor that uh president biden invited to the White House for a visit that uh, that if a joint statement again would be relatively uninspiring uh, and vanilla that perhaps that would not reflect well on the visit itself as well as the status of the relationship. I think maybe that influenced the South Koreans. But I also think because I think the South Koreans are certainly much better negotiators than we usually are that uh, perhaps there was, that there's something in the offing that we would be able to demonstrate additional flexibility on something that's important to President Moon. Afcon transition has been important to him. So we'll see. Well, I will be reading with bated breath the joint communique that comes out of this SCM, particularly knowing that every word is debated for hours on end. <laughs> After that. Also, just out of, I don't know, I have a point of personal curiosity, I suppose. Um, if the majority party in South Korea, given all of the political turmoil, um, may want to make use of sort of these all time low um, public favorability ratings towards China as well. Um, but speaking of which, uh, there's another interesting development um, that you and I spoke about previously, which is the AUKUS trilateral security pact. Um, I think for most of us freedom loving people, uh, this is a pretty welcome development. However, do you see this as potentially devaluing um, our bilateral Pacific alliances or the Five Eye community? Um, and also, how do you think we can take advantage of this in the indo pacom region? So overarchingly, I think this announcement is an exceptionally positive development because quite frankly, I think it's something that um, people didn't expect. I certainly don't think the Chinese expected it. And again, the reality is we cannot compete with the Chinese dollar for 
color, you know, ship for ship, airplane for airplane. So our, the, our competitive advantage is our alliances, is our partnerships. And being able to uh, now work with the Brits and, and uh, well, working with the Brits to provide the Australians with the capability that they did not have before, that given the time and space challenges of the Pacific, um, it's certainly not a game changer, but I will tell you it significantly um, complicates Chinese calculus. And, uh, and I think that that is, again, a phenomenally positive um, development. To your other point, I mean, in essence, this you know, trilateral alignment or, or you know, club is now, I think you could say, our, the most exclusive club to, you know, of nations. Whereas the Five Eyes community before, I think, you could characterize as the most exclusive. Well, now this is even more exclusive. So I can imagine, particularly in New Zealand and Canada, our allies there are wondering, okay, where does this leave us now? So then if you think about, you know, an, in my opinion, the next um, up and coming uh, strategically important grouping of, of countries, like-minded countries is the Quad. So again, you, you know, in the quad, you've got uh, the United States and Australia, who are then also members of the Five Eyes and members of this, and I don't even know how to pronounce it yet, AUKUS. Um, you know, this certainly, I'm, I'm, it'll be interesting to see since the quad, the leaders of the quad are actually meeting next week in Washington, if and how this comes up, because it, again, new organization really leapfrogs uh, all the other ones in terms of exclusivity. So I could imagine, for instance, the Japanese, uh, although in true Japanese fashion, they're maintaining uh, their demeanor and they're being discreet right now. They're probably thinking, what does this mean to us? And if those kinds of, you know, internal conversations are going on in Tokyo, you have to ask yourself, well, what do you think is going on in Seoul? Because if the Japanese are potentially concerned because they were excluded, uh, you know, this, I would say South Korea is even more concerned because we've been, we've grown more strategically aligned with Japan than we have with South Korea for the last several years. Although again, like I mentioned a couple of moments ago, I do think things for the last several months have been a, uh, a positive development, and again, that strategic alliance, excuse me, strategic alignment between the U.S. and South Korea. Because I was concerned about that while I was still in the Pentagon. I, I thought, particularly on issues related to China, uh, we were uh, we were not completely aligned. Frankly, Roger that. Um, and as you mentioned with Five Eyes, I, I think another thing that you're and many of the people in this call are very familiar with, um, especially in Japan. And I, I've heard some discussion of it in Korea as well, but discussion of the 5i plus Japan or 5i plus rock, which the rocks and the Japanese have been clamoring for for a while. Um, one must wonder what those negotiators are thinking right now. Um, yeah, I think it complicates things. It really does. Again, but let me just say, uh, because it's worth repeating, overarchingly, though, I think that this really puts an additional piece on the, you know, on that strategic chessboard uh, when it comes to competition with China. And uh, there are, there are, you know, some issues in the region, and not to mention the fact that, you know, the French are not particularly happy right now. Uh, I think that those are all things that um, over time uh, are worth um, the real strategic impact that's going to have now by being able to provide Australia with the capability that it would have otherwise never have been able to uh, obtain. No, Roger that. Um, so uh, I think people might be getting tired of hearing me talk. Uh, 
Uh, one of the strengths of having a opportunity like this in our coffee and chat forum is the ability for uh, FAOs and specialists in the region to be able to engage with our distinguished members and uh, really just distinguished leaders in the field such as yourself. So at this time, I'd like to ask that if anyone has a question or would like to engage with, uh, with, with Colonel Klink on any discussion points, please use the raise hand function. Uh, just due to the number of people we have in the chat room today, uh, if you can um, use the raise hand, I'll call on you and then uh, you can please ask your question. All right. Oh, all right, Craig, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, sir, for your remarks so far. I'm uh, Lieutenant Commander Greg Pavone. Um, speaking to you from my apartment here in Seoul. Forgive me if you hear my daughter in the background. Um, I am the uh, uh, action officer for U.S. bridging and enduring capabilities as a part of the uh, COTP conditions based off con transition plan. Uh, and um, I'm really asking, sir, for if you could, some real time advice and insights. So we have the kid coming up in nine days. Next month uh, is it gonna be the final PMC before the MCM SCM and then MCM SCM probably November 10th. Uh, so I've been working at Bridging Enduring for the last uh, almost two years and I'm per continuously vexed by this issue. Um, so we're talking about dozens and dozens of capabilities uh, that 15 years of joint communiques have said the U.S. will provide bridging and enduring capabilities to the ROC. Um, and we're talking about billions of dollars worth of capability as well that I have heard senior leaders say this is treaty level stuff. This is treaty level stuff. Uh, so that's on the one. Hand. And then I also see, on the other hand, um, the ROC investing in F-35s, submarine launch ballistic missiles, aircraft carrier, kind of, they're a sovereign country, they invest in what they want. The US wants them to fight, invest in, I would say fight tonight things, like for example, the list of bridging and enduring capabilities, which we consider as rock shortfalls. Um, so I guess my, and, and then last point, uh, problem that I've, I've experienced is that there's a lot of overlap between the critical military capabilities, which they must require, acquire before Afcon, and the bridging and enduring capabilities, which they do not have to acquire before Afcon. But if, you, and, and I've, there's an effort right now from the ROC to decouple them, let's just do the CMCs and let's not focus on bridging and enduring. Uh, so there's, a, there's an incredible amount of political pressure right now for this SCM, it's the last one of the Moon administration to, to get something, as you said, accomplished. Um, do you have any general advice, guidance? I'm literally going into work right after this to work this issue. <laughs> Uh, do you have any general advice, guidance, insights as you work this um, in your time as, as DASD, sir? A combination of caffeine and Tums. Make sure you have bottles of each in your office. Um, so the political pressure is what's key, okay? Because at the end of the day, what um, the I know what I can imagine what the political pressure is uh, from President Moon onto Minister Su. I don't really know what political pressure, if any, there is from President Biden uh, to Secretary Austin. Okay. I will tell you again, for us, it was pretty steadfast. Okay. Um, we're, you know, it was pretty steadfast. I mean, this, this was, I, there was a unanimity amongst the civilian and uniform leadership within the department that we were not going to take any shortcuts. This is what we and the rocks agreed to. We agreed to this. We signed on the dotted line. We're not going to change that. Um, and there was constant pressure, uh, you know, from our interlocutors to, in essence, exploit whatever seems, oftentimes it was, you know, seems and language. That's why those joint communiques are actually important. And from the perspective of, um, 
you know, the Koreans, if you agree to certain language, the, the Koreans will use that <laughs> to their advantage. Uh, that's why I was never a big favor of communiques because they did nothing for us, frankly. And I was, I, I really attached importance to them other than ensuring that it reflected accurately the U.S. position. And I would not compromise on that. So, um, you know, part of the, the discussion, though, at the more strategic and at the political level has to be or has to include, you know, South Korea, is what, the number 10 economy in the world based on what the World Bank or IMF, something like that. And whereas, you know, we're treaty partners, we're allies, uh, and we're committed to, you know, each other's mutual defense. So there is a role for, you know, these, these uh, enduring and bridging capabilities, but there can't just necessarily be the expectation, particularly in light of the fact that the South Koreans are putting so much money into those types of capabilities that you listed that are frankly not part of COTP and that are developed, in my opinion, in part to support uh, an indigenous defense industry, which I get, every democracy goes through that, you know, I get that, I understand the political imperatives here. And also certain things that I would actually characterize as prestige weapons. So, you know, so, so this is where that dilemma occurs, uh, where, you know, if I were for my, you know, South Korean, getting some feedback here. Um, I would say to my Korean interlocutors, you know, it's very difficult for the United States, given its global responsibilities and given, you know, the, the attention that American voters, American taxpayers pay to our defense commitments and to our defense budget, that we can just indefinitely provide all these things in the, at the same time as you are consciously making decisions to invest in technologies and capabilities that do not advance opcon transition. So I have a silver bullet for you. Um, I think what's going to be key is to ensure that there's complete alignment between the political leadership and the military leadership uh, so that the guidance that you get you know, you're backstopped basically. Because if you're not backstopped at the highest level, you're frankly, you're gonna be wasting your time. And that's one thing that I, you know, look back upon favorably knowing that the positions that I was advocating for, that my team was advocating for, in this context, we were aligned with SFK we were aligned with Indo-PACOM, we were aligned with the Joint Staff, and Secretary Esper was completely supportive, as was the NSC and the State Department. Thank you, sir. Sure thing. Okay. Uh, Follow-on questions from the group. Okay. Well, I, I sort of have a question, I suppose. Um, all people might be thinking might be thinking of one. Um, so, something that a lot of FAOs are thinking about these days is um, you formerly oversaw the Army FAO program. You've probably heard of some recent changes, assignments, uh, the marketplace, and then most notably, uh, transition to an overarching Indo Asia Pacific FAO uh, to be realigned into one area of concentration. Uh, just what would you say would you, as far as advice would be for FAOs that are in the region or for FAOs that could be in your former position on how to most effectively implement or adapt to this change? So when I heard about this, uh, frankly, I was kind of disappointed, to be honest with you, because... I think, and I'm, you know, and remember, I've been out of the army for about six years now. Um, I was a year group 89 officer, so things were definitely different. Um, but I will tell you what made the army's FAO program the gold standard 
was the expertise that was founded in our training education, namely language, grad school, in country or in region training, coupled with repetitive assignments in our area of concentration so that you could, with a straight face, self-describe yourself as, I am an expert in, name the region, name the country. My concern with this pro, you know, with this programmatic change is that you're diluting that expertise because all of you know that someone who is a Korea expert is, you know, going to Indonesia is something completely different. Going to Bangladesh is completely different. Going to China is completely different. And whereas you could make the same argument in Europe as well, I think it's more striking in Asia than it is in Europe. And this is coming from a guy who spent, what, 15, 16, 17 years in Europe. Uh, so I don't think this is a positive development. My assumption is that this was driven by resource issues and by promotion statistics. And those are things that have always been challenges throughout the history of the failed program. And, you know, there are no easy answers, quite frankly, when it comes to resource uh, limitations and timeline issues and, you know, and who's getting promoted and who should be getting promoted. And for, as someone who now is, you know, no longer responsible for managing you know, a core of, I think we had like 1,200, maybe 1,300 fails at the time. Um, you know, it's almost as if it's Groundhog Day all over again. Because when I've talked to folks, including general officers that are fails, the challenges that the fail core has today in, in, in manning uh, and in training dollars, it's the exact same stuff that I fought for a decade ago, which is disconcerting frankly so you know but my overarching advice to every officer and i've always said this and for some of you that maybe remember me from when i was a proponent i used to go out to monterey and you know i think it was twice a year and talk to all the new fails coming to dli i always said it doesn't matter what job you go to do the best thing you possibly can because frankly you know we all work under this assumption that there are some good jobs and there's some bad jobs and you want to obviously get the good jobs you know what i would say is if you do poorly in a in a good job it's it's you know still not you know worse than doing well in what you don't think is a good job i don't know if that makes sense at all but at the end of the day you need to excel you need to set yourself apart from your peers and you always got to give it your best i will tell you when i was a major you know the first the, my very first two jobs as fails were not jobs that i wanted to go to and back then those were jobs that were considered uh not to be good jobs and i ended up by myself and i did well and i used both of those you know both those opportunities as springboards to go do other things so um so you know sometimes that's hard to kind of reconcile when you, the army sends you somewhere you don't really want to go but uh again you know the, i can only give you the most simple of advice which is do the best you can regardless of where you are roger that sir um so i have a message here uh i'm sorry i didn't explain this but if you want to use the raise hand function uh they're under reactions uh is the raise hand function um uh, and but we do have a question i believe um <laughs> For, uh, from Josh Duran. Hey, sir. Um, Josh Duran here. Thank you for your time. Uh, I've got a softball question, but any chance, any opportunity I get to speak with a, uh, a senior community mentor, I always, I always take the opportunity to ask this question. Um, and the question is, uh, sir, what are you reading now? And what do you recommend to us as more uh, junior foreign area officers? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because I don't read as many books as I used to because just like everybody else, I'm on the computer all day. I'm constantly reading stuff online, which is kind of 
you know, unfortunate. Um, so when I think about the last book that I read, actually it is, uh, I'm looking at it right now, although I can't, I can't uh, read the title. Secretary Gates wrote a book about leadership, came out, I think, five, six years ago. And he talks about experiences leading three major organizations. One was, of course, the Department of Defense when he was the Secretary of Defense. One was the Central Intelligence Agency when he was the director there. And was, one was Texas A&M when he was the president of the university. And, and it's, got, I think, some really superb leadership lessons in it because he successfully is able to draw lessons from three very, very different types of organizations that are applicable to, you know, if you're in public service or in the private sector as well. So I can't remember the name of the book, to be honest with you. I could get up and, and go grab it off my shelf. Uh, but it, he, it, it's, a, it's not his memoirs, but it's a book that he wrote about leadership. And I just read it last month, I think, when I was uh, uh, on vacation. So that's the last book I've actually read. <laughs> Sir, thank you for your recommendation. But I have been reading all kinds of excerpts from, uh, from uh, you know, the book coming out apparently, you know, entitled Peril, where General Milley's written, uh, mentioned a lot. So. <laughs> uh, before I try to seize on that opening, is there any, uh, any other questions? OK. Sir, knowing that it's a very sensitive topic in the media right now, um, is that something uh, that you'd be comfortable commenting on? So I'll, I'll, I'll share with you the comment I made, I think, on LinkedIn. You know, in any great work of fiction, there are always some kernels of truth. So, you know, so I, I think um, that my overarching comment be, I believe that General Milley um, ha has made himself to be a political leader more than a, just a military leader. And I think that started in, in the Trump administration, it's continued into the Biden administration. And I think that's why you're seeing this type of uh, attention to uh, what he may or may not have said during calls uh, with uh, a Chinese military leader. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. In general, um, at the strategic levels of policymaking, do you do you think that there are obviously right now a lot of it, a lot of scrutiny is being paid to on the disadvantages of having a politically oriented leader, but would you say that there are certain advantages to having uh, politically savvy leaders in strategic positions uh, as far as military are concerned? Well, being politically savvy is different than being political. So obviously, if you're a senior leader, a senior uniform leader here in Washington in particular, um, it's important to be able to get the support of the political establishment, whether it's your civilian leadership within the Department of Defense or um, in the White House itself, as well as being able to get uh, support on, on Capitol Hill. So that, you know, so I think being politically savvy is important. Being political is, is a little different in that. Uh, and again, I, I don't necessarily want to, you know, share all of my personal opinions on this matter, but I think um, there is a difference. I, so for instance, I, I view General Dunford as a, a senior military leader who was politically savvy, but was not political. And, uh, and I think he represented the institution particularly well. Um, not to say that General Milley hasn't, but I think you can draw some distinction between how General Dunford um, and General Milley 
uh, were were viewed basically based on how uh, how they engage on the public stage. Much of that, sir. I, I hope you get invited uh, to discuss this topic on one of our mainstream media sources. <laughs> for uh, for the next question, I uh, I see a hand from Tom. Yeah, thank you for your time, sir. Um, I hope you don't mind if I ask you a more China-oriented question. Um, what What do you think the biggest factors are in Beijing's calculus towards Taiwan right now, and how do you think those have changed um, over the past year or two? You said towards Taiwan. I I, I missed the the verb before that. Uh, what do you think the biggest factors are in Beijing's calculus towards Taiwan? Ah, okay. So let me tell you what I think has changed. What has changed is the emergence of Xi Jinping as a paramount leader, uh, unlike anyone since Mao Zedong. So whereas, you know, after Mao's death in the mid seventies, the leaders that came to the fore still operated on the one hand based on consensus you know consensus again among a small group obviously standing committee of the Politburo, abided by Deng Xiaoping's maxim of basically you know by your time and keep a, a profile Xi Jinping excuse me yeah, Xi Jinping has jettisoned all that so his first several years in office, you know, he focused on purging any potential uh, rivals, uh, and he has now become really an unparalleled um, leader in what was already an autocratic uh, system. And I think we're going to see next year at the Party Congress that he's going to be installed for a third term as the general secretary of the CCP, president of the People's Republic, and then of course, chairman of the Central Military Commission. So what's changed is that it doesn't appear as if there are many dissenting voices, if any, left, and that he is trying to extend party control, but not just party control, but party control through the prism of Xi Jinping thought onto every aspect of society, including the economy now as well, where, you know, see there, if you just look at the last month, for instance, there's been new laws that have been passed uh, regarding uh, Bitcoin and just all kinds of stuff where the, before the party and the, and the state would allow a certain, um, not necessarily freedom, if you will, but a certain amount of um, decision making that was not necessarily influenced by the party or the state. Now, the party and the state are just permeating every aspect of Chinese society and economy. With respect to Taiwan in particular, my concern is that he based on what he's calling the rejuvenation of the Chinese people is viewing Taiwan as the last thing to accomplish in essence. And that he wants to be able to do it on his watch and that he wants to be able to have this as his legacy. Moreover, whereas before and years before, the general consensus and opinion was that time was on China's side. Now, based on the evolution of Taiwan society, it's generally accepted on both side of the, sides of the Taiwan Strait that it's, it's no longer, uh, time is no longer on China's side in terms of, you know, the Taiwan people will decide uh, well, you know, that they want to return to the motherland. Frankly, based on what the Chinese have done to Hong Kong, 
the de facto abrogation of one country, two systems, which remember was meant to be the model for Taiwan as well. Um, and the outright aggression that uh, the Chinese have shown towards Taiwan, particularly in the last year with ever more uh, PLA incursions into the air and maritime domains of Taiwan. It's crystal clear in Taiwan, you know, your average Taiwan citizen that, you know, what awaits if China uh, absorbs Taiwan? And nobody wants that. I mean, if you think about it, if you've grown up in Taiwan and, you know, you, you're living basically in, in what's you know, truly a beacon of democracy, you know, a country, well, I shouldn't say country, but a place, <laughs> I guess I can say country, government, um, uh, you know, a place that evolved peacefully from autocratic rule. Let's remember, you know, the KMT ruled Taiwan under martial law for decades. There was a, a peaceful evolution to a democratic state where now you have, you know, a place that's run by a woman president. That's a big deal. A national assembly that has one of the highest percentages of women, you know, female representation in the world. I think the only place in Asia Pacific that has enshrined in law LGBTQ rights, absolute freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. You know, how can people go back? I, I don't see it. You know, and polling supports this. Whereas previously, um, polling that occurred, time, you know, Taiwan citizens uh, identified more as being Chinese. Um, now, the, the vast majority of citizens on the island don't identify as Chinese anymore. They identify as Taiwanese. That's a big deal. So Beijing sees that. And frankly, I don't think Beijing, even when they try to use economic incentives, although lately uh, they, they use economic coercion more than trying to incentivize the Taiwans, um, e even that I don't think is gonna suffice. And, and that's why my concern is really doubled by this new cult of personality that Xi Jinping is, um, his fostering and his potential overarching desire for a legacy of you know Chinese unification, coupled with the fact that I think they know in Beijing that there's not going to be peace unification because Taiwan people are just they're not they don't want to be ruled by by the CCP because they see what's going on in in Hong Kong and. And in Hong Kong, you know, they could have, the, the, the Chinese could have waited. They could have waited, uh, uh, but they decided to basically incorporate Hong Kong into the mainland, like any other Chinese city, quite frankly. So, so, that, that, so that's why I am, those reasons alone give me cause for concern. Okay, I think we have time for one more, and I see a question from Greg. Yeah, sir, just as a follow up to that, I seem to remember from uh, Admiral Davidson's March report to um, the Senate Armed Services Committee that he, I think he said within five to six years, he predicts a, a Chinese move to, to annex Taiwan. Um, and with all that said, thank you so much for that. Um, how do you think the U.S. should respond if China does, be it an amphibious assault or be it with uh, cyber attacks, if China does make a move under Xi's time to seize Taiwan, how, how should the US and our allies respond and, and what should we do, start be doing now to prepare? So just to, to clarify a little bit, I don't think that Admiral Davidson predicted that that would ask, actually occur. I think what he stated was that, um, this is a particularly dangerous time given PLA modernization efforts and that within that period, they could very well self-assess that they would have the capability to successfully 
uh, launch offensive action against Taiwan. So that being said, um, a couple points. So as far as I'm concerned, this is not just about Taiwan, okay? This is about uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific. This is about our role as, um, frankly, the leader of the free world and you know our credibility and our commitment to our regional allies as well as to our allies and partners um, globally. If Taiwan were to be ruled by you know CCP-led uh, government in Beijing, that would in essence mean that they have now the dominant position in Asia Pacific. Because quite frankly, if they obtain Taiwan, you know, in the first island chain, um, I, for instance, could not foresee that happening successfully without an attack on Japan as well. Uh, because I think the defense of Taiwan really equals the defense of Japan. And uh, and, you know, we have a treaty obligation to Japan, obviously. We don't have any treaty obligations to Taiwan. We have got the TRA, and depending on how you interpret the TRA, the Taiwan Relations Act, you know, some say it means we would come, you know, to their defense. Some, you know, quote the TRA saying that it commits us to providing uh, self-defense capabilities to Taiwan. So, you know, you, you can... Um, you can interpret it in different ways. That being said, though, again, um, the TRA's legislation, which some would say is actually more powerful than a bilateral international treaty. And if there's actually one issue that has widespread bipartisan support in DC, it is Taiwan. Now, not Taiwan independence, but Taiwan autonomy and Taiwan status quo. But to your question of, you know, the military aspect, you know, and it goes to deterrence, frankly. You know, I think the very first thing that has to happen is Taiwan needs to demonstrate a commitment to its own defense, okay? And they are doing, you know, many things right. And as a matter of fact, I saw an article today that discussed increases in the Taiwan defense budget, which is great and, and, and frankly uh, needed. Uh, the Taiwan defense budget, I think, is like 2.1, 2.2% of GDP. That's not enough for a place that faces an existential threat. But it's not just about money. It's about what do you spend the money on? And my, you know, in my opinion, uh, they have not, all the Taiwans have not prioritized the types of asymmetric capabilities that they, that they need. Uh, so that's important. Moreover, they, you know, my concern as well is that Structurally, they have not made the types of reforms required, reforms to the reserve system, the focus more on a territorial defense model, which again, you know, would if, if the Chinese, the Chinese, in my opinion, are basically focused on getting a lodgement on the beach and then pushing in and defeating the Taiwan armed forces. If they had to worry about every Taiwan citizen, you know, ha you know having some the military training and, you know, a rifle in their basement or a javelin in their garage, whatever, you know, uh, I think that that would too would complicate PLA capitalism. And, and something drastic like that is required, frankly, because whereas, again, polling data shows that your average Taiwan uh, person is willing to fight for Taiwan. If you ask them, though, are you willing to serve in the military? The answer is no. Because your average person just doesn't want to join the military in Taiwan. That's got to change. Okay, that's got to change. And, and I, what I've said to Taiwan counterparts is that, you know, we, the United States, don't need to be a model for you. Okay, you know, there are certain things that may be applicable from us from a societal perspective, from a military perspective, but there are plenty of other places in the world where you can draw lessons learned, whether it's Finland, Switzerland, Israel, Singapore, even, to be able to build a robust 
territorial defense that incorporates your citizens. Um, these are things that I think are integral and essential to an, an effective deterrent. And God forbid if that deterrence fails, actually being able to hold out long enough so that the international community can come and help. Okay. Uh, and I think that the more Taiwan does to demonstrate its commitment to its own defense, the greater the likelihood is that the international community, not just the United States, but other countries will come to Taiwan's defense. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, Thank you. oh, this is, we're about to, really you guys an interesting conversation. This, we are at about time. I'd like to offer you the chance to uh, provide any sort of closing remarks. Um, and then if you're available uh, afterwards, I, I did get some direct messages asking if you'd be willing to ask a couple of questions uh, after recording is stopped. Sure, happy to. Okay. Well, again, thanks very much uh, for uh, the great questions. I appreciate it. You know, I mean, over my overarching opinion now, after I've been out of office for about nine months, almost nine months, is that the trend lines in the U.S. South Korean strategic relationship are positive, and I think that. Um, that is something that when I was in office last year at this time, I would not have been able to say, to be perfectly candid with you. So I'm very happy to note that it appears that uh, there's a, a greater strategic alignment, uh, you know, particularly with respect to the challenge that, that China poses uh, to all of us in the region. So. I am looking forward to seeing what comes out of the SCM, just like all of you are. I'll be rooting for all of you guys that are working on MCM and SCM. You know, just remember that uh, the pain that you'll be enduring leading up to uh, and during, it will be fleeting compared to if you agree to something that'll be held against you afterwards. <laughs> so that's an excellent point. Uh, Thank you again today for your incredible insight. Uh, before we close, I would like to remind today's participants to become a full paying member of the Foreign Area Officer Association if, if you have not already done so, and please consider a tax deductible donation through your support. And should COVID subside, we hope to resume in-person events um, to better enable networking and professional development. This concludes today's coffee and chat for today. Everyone enjoy your weekend. And Chusok. Thank you. <laughs>